Welcome to the Little Cities of Black Diamonds Fest 2021 from Whence We Came. My name is Nikki Mazaka and I'm a member of the Little Cities of Black Diamonds Council. Thank you so much for joining us as we share and celebrate stories of migration to the Little Cities region. So far this week our historians have shared their wonderful presentations on migration. And we want to end our festival this year by zooming in and sharing personal histories from folks in the Little Cities area. One of our volunteers is Harold Keller. Harold is originally from Corning, Ohio, and he graciously invited me and my fellow council member, Scott Moore, to his home to share his family history with us and his sense of humor. Harold Keller, Harold R, and the R stands for redneck. Uh, no, not really, but I get accused of it quite a bit. And you're interested in history, and so am I. It was very easy to see Harold's passion for history. He had a stack of papers and photographs ready to go in his workshop when he started telling us his story. That's Grandpa Keller's manifest right there. Yeah, Grandpa was born in 1872. I don't know which one of them is Grandpa. That's the whole family. That's yeah. my dad's side of the family. That's my dad right there. And that's my Grandma Keller. One of them fellas is Grandpa. And I don't know which one it is because this is a poor picture. Grandma was a native Swede, and her maiden name was Olga Olson. I've got their wedding picture in the house. Yeah, well, I'll show it to you if you're interested. Yeah, she was a Swedish immigrant, and Grandpa was a native German. His name was Louis, and I'm not sure about what that might be him right there, because all them boys are just homelier in hell. <laughs> Uncle Jake. All these are brothers, but they're all immigrants. Uncle Jake was the driller in the family oil business. Back in the 1800s, Jake and his brother Emil were in the uh, German army, and they had what amounted to universal military training, where when you turned 18, everybody went in the army. Uncle Jake played a trombone in the German army band. And Germany and France fought all the time over a strip of land called Alsace-Lorraine. And I don't know who owns it now, but the German army was camped up pretty close to the border and evidently getting ready to invade the next day or shortly. Well, they wasn't too damn happy about going over there and fighting a Frenchman. And Emil and Jake and three other men whose names is lost, when the band took a break, they skinned out across the border. They were actually deserters from the German army. When they got across the border, they ran into a French sentry. And it was probably something like halt or all shoot. But back in them days, Army rifles were a single shot. And probably it was one of them, yeah, you can shoot one of us, but the rest of us will cut your throat. And it was one of them don't ask, don't tell deals, and the sentry let them pass. They made their way across France, and he said, <laughs> Uncle Jake was a short, stocky built fella, and they stole women's clothes off of clotheslines, and one of them would dress up like a woman, and if somebody important <laughs> come by, they'd probably hold hands like they just levered out for a walk. Made their way clear across France, Havre, H-A-V-R-E, which is a big seaport, still is. They had money some way or other to buy passage across to Ellis Island. And the manifest shows the picture of the ship they come over on and of course they were all steam engines back in them days. When they landed in Ellis Island, they evidently had contacts or family over here already, but they got to a man named Riddlesberger, which obviously was German, and Riddlesberger had oil enters out here, and they hired on to work for Riddlesberger. They made some kind of a deal with Riddlesberger to where they would start out on their own. The first drilling rig was all homemade, Uncle Jake. He, he was a kindly old man, I liked him. He lived in a Masonic building in Corning. They rented out rooms on the second floor. 
Uncle Jake, any time we went out on the street, he was well-dressed. Had a three-piece suit with a vest on it. At that time, the post office was in the Masonic building, and it was my job to get the mail. And at age about 10, 11, 12, something like that, I'd walk down there, and in good weather, Jake would be sitting out in front of the bank on a concrete ledge, and he was real old at that time, naturally. And I'd go by and I'd say, good morning, Uncle Jake. He wasn't my uncle, he's my dad's uncle, but nevertheless, he'd look at me real funny like he's trying to figure out who I was. And I'd go in and get the mail and come back out. By that time, he figured out who I was. And he couldn't pronounce Harold, but he called me Haydert. Haydert, come here. And he'd reach into his vest pocket and pull out a nickel. Here is for you a eagle. Spoke real broken German, you know. And I'd say, gee, thanks, Uncle Jake. And I'd take that nickel and I'd bust her for the drugstore. In the early 40s, you could get a double dip rice cream cone for a nickel. <laughs> and I always felt kindly toward Uncle Jake, being nice to us, not knowing a little kid. That yeah, there's a uh, we own the lease over there across the road that runs as E. Keller, Emil Keller. And it's played out now, but we had a good well there till the highway come through. Yeah, Uncle Jake and my dad's generation, my generation, and the boy Wes's generation, and his boy Jeremiah's 40 years old. Wes has got our drilling rig set up over a well way up here in an ungodly hollow. I love banjo picking and I don't have any musical ability at all. I can hardly play a radio. Yeah, I bought that off my wife's grandpa lived up above New Concord and he could play it and he had two of them. And my boy Wesso can pick on one. You see all them clamps around the head of it? There's 39 clamps on it. And old timers have told me that the value of a banjo is often determined by the number of clamps on it. Cheap ones only have six or eight clamps, and that's got 39 clamps on it. I've got strings loose, so it won't warp the neck. But uh, Grandpa Charlie said, uh, that's a new drum head on there. And he said, it's made out of a calf's stomach. My wife's grandpa. Yeah, he was an old mountaineer, and he never had an outside job all of his life. He made his living by himself. He was part Indian, and he could sneak up on a deer when the deer was sleeping. He was that good in the woods. When I was a kid, Corning was full of immigrants, and, and they all had native names, like uh, Dominic or Kiki that run the restaurant. And then there was uh, almost everybody in town had a native name, like Keller. There was still a little bit of native languages because I remember one time there were a lot of Hungarians over in Congo and a couple of them was over to Corning and he was eating dinner in Dominic's restaurant and Dominic was a native Italian he was a, and these two fellows were talking to one another in Hungarian and Dominic said speak the United States when I was a kid I had a paper out in Corning the paper the daily paper, I think, was uh, 26 cents a week, so I made a lot of money. And you could win Dominic's restaurant and get a steak dinner for, I think, 75 or 85 cents. And about maybe once a month, I'd go in there and get a steak dinner because kids are hungry all the time. And it was always the same. You'd go in there and sit down, and Dominic would say, what the hell are one of you, kid? <laughs> how about a steak dinner, Nick? Okay, kid, how you want him cooked? Well, being a smart aleck kid, I said, how about rare on the outside and well done in the middle? He said, you're a smart aleck, a son of a bitch, ain't you? <laughs> yeah, my mom and her sister, Aunt Jessie, worked in there when they was still living back on the farm, and they would ride a bus from where they lived up above Renville down to Dominic's. Yeah, that's where my dad met my mom in next restaurant. After our conversation, I asked Harold why he thought it was important to preserve and share our histories with future generations. This is what he had to say. Oh yeah, yeah, it's very important. If you don't know where you come from, you probably don't have much of an idea where you're going. That's the way I look at it. And my family goes back 
included <laughs> Germany. And I'm really kind of proud of it because they left with nothing and ended up pretty successful businessmen. A huge thank you to Harold Keller for his time and his story and to Scott Moore for arranging the interview. Thank you all so much for listening and participating in the Little Cities of Black Diamonds Fest 2021. If you're interested in sharing your family's migration story or your own, we're having a story swap at 12 o'clock p.m. on Saturday, October 12th on Zoom. You can find the link to that on our festival website. It's www.lcbdohio.org slash lcbd-festival-2021. If you're interested in learning more about the history of the Little Cities of Black Diamonds region, please visit our website, www.lcbdohio.org. We have several history articles, short documentaries, a digital archive, and the Miners Registry, all of which are free and open to the public. If you have a question, you can fill out our Ask an Historian form online and we'll be happy to answer it for you. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Bye, y'all.